Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Connor Vierty. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the notes tell you you have to say who you are. You know. They leave nothing to chance. And I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you here. It's uh, an event which combines two of my own interests, so I'm delighted about that. It's uh, an event organized by the Center for the Study of Human Rights here at LSC, which uh, is an organization of which I was director for some few years and have now been, uh, have left, and Professor Bat is here, who's my successor. Uh, and the center was started in LSE in 2000, which is the same year in which the uh, Matrix, Matrix Chambers was established, which is a barrister's organization. We had long debates, I'm a member of that too, we had long debates when we started about whether we would call ourselves Chambers. We were incredibly, we thought, innovative. We uh, tried to get away from the traditions of the bar and to develop a new ethos and a new set of values for the bar uh, and we were told we wouldn't succeed and we'd fail and go the way of all new sets as they call them and we're still here and so this is also not only a center for the study of human rights event but it's a, it's a matrix chambers event and a celebration of 10 years of matrix chambers it's our 10th anniversary. We enjoyed our 10th anniversary so much we decided to extend it into our 11th year. So <laughs> this is, I'm reliably informed, the culmination of our year and a half, one year celebration. <laughs> and uh, to mark it, uh, we are establishing various new values and the most recent one has been uh, a value which commits ourselves to a degree of environmental sustainability and all of our values are available on the web. And we're therefore delighted uh, that we have uh, tonight to mark the uh, 10th anniversary and also uh, as a visitor to the Centre for the Study of Human Rights, a visitor, I may say, who uh, launched my own directorship of the Centre for the Study of Human Rights in 2002, a person who's, as uh, will be apparent, is very much now involved in issues of climate justice. And uh, that is, of course, uh, Mary Robinson here, who is uh, a lawyer, uh, and a former senator in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and most, uh, after that, then went on to become president of the Republic of Ireland as from 1990 to 1997, at a time of incredible change for the better in Ireland. Uh, my personal opinion is that Mary Robinson both facilitated and represented the positive aspects of that change and left an amazing imprint on the culture. Uh, and went from there to the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, which Mary was from 1997 to 2002. So uh, a record that needs no explanation, really. But more recently, and this takes me to the subject of the talk, uh, there is a foundation for climate justice, the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice, which is now based in Dublin, which Mary will uh, allude in the course of her talk, I'm sure. And that is, in a sense, the platform for the kinds of issues that we're going to have rehearsed this evening under the general title of climate change needs climate justice. The plan is that Mary will speak for a little while. It won't, it will, it'll be uh, 40 minutes or so, I suppose, give or take a few minutes. And then we'll have a number of questions and answers, and we'll all be winding down at about 10 to 8, 5 to 8, perhaps up to 8 o'clock. At which point, I'm delighted to say you'll be able to get a drink. Uh, when I was centre director, I insisted that every event should be followed by drinks, and I'm glad to see. <laughs> Uh, and in some occasions preceded by drinks. Uh, uh, and I'm delighted that my uh, su successor, Professor Bath, has followed that uh, tradition of bibulous entertainment. So, uh, as is traditional, I reveal the location of the drinks at the last minute. Uh, my experience is that the room will empty, but probably not for Mary Robinson. So can you give her a tremendous round of applause and a welcome to Thank you very much, Connor. Um, and I would like to warmly congratulate and commend the Center for Human Rights and the Matrix Chambers on their 10 and a half, 11th, <laughs> pretending to be 10th anniversary. I'm glad to see the Chief Executive of the Matrix Chambers and the current uh, head of the uh, Human Rights Center here. And I'm really very pleased to be back here in LSE. 
And, uh, you know, that's loyalty for you in difficult times. I mean, your friends come back and <laughs> want to talk um, and, give, and give a lecture. And I'm particularly pleased uh, to talk about climate justice, about which I'm very passionate. And I hope we can have a really good uh, discussion and question and answer uh, session uh, when I finish. It's appropriate that I would talk about climate justice here in LSE because in a roundabout way, LSE did contribute to my thinking and the sense of wanting to focus in this area. Uh, when I last spoke here, um, it was in fact to help Conor Geerty, then head of the Human Rights Centre, to formally launch the centre. I was very supportive of the idea that LSE would have a centre for human rights. It wasn't obvious at the time. It's now so much part of the texture that you don't think about it. But it wasn't so obvious. It was a courageous enough decision, and I think a very um, good one at the time. And I remember saying to Connor, now, remember, if you have a human rights center here, you must focus on some issues in relation to Africa. And we left that conversation, and several years passed, and then Connor invited me to attend a conference in Rwanda, which LSE and the Center for Human Rights and the government of Rwanda co-hosted on, and this was the title of the conference, on climate change, development, adaptation, and human rights. It was a very good conference attended by a significant number of African experts and um, experts who had come for that particular conference. And listening to those experts describe the negli negligible contribution that African countries had made to greenhouse gas emissions, but the devastating impact it was already having, particularly on subsistence farmers, on flooding in the, the slum areas of cities, really hardship issues, and uh, being spoken about with very first-hand knowledge. It really persuaded me to focus on climate justice and to establish the foundation, the Mayor Robinson Foundation Climate Justice, and perhaps it won't surprise you to know that Connor is one of my board members, so I have to be particularly polite to him these days, <laughs> which is a change from the, from the past. Um, now, as the climate um, change agenda has moved on through Copenhagen, where we all thought we would get a fair binding deal, and then on to Cancun, which in fact put the process a bit back on track, I think we need to probe more deeply into some of the key areas. This evening, I'd like to focus on the legal aspects of a climate agreement and the implications for climate justice and uh, ultimately the men, women and children most vulnerable um, to the impacts of climate change. They need a climate agreement. The people who bear the brunt of the impacts of climate change and did least to cause the problem, and yet are suffering already, as I saw on a recent visit uh, to Bangladesh last month. Um, Travelling to the Delta region, already prone to cyclones, I was struck by how vital new adaptation methods and climate resilient techniques are, and uh, will be even more so in the future as severe weather patterns increase and water levels continue to rise. Above all, securing a new legally binding climate change agreement would be an important step in protecting their lives and their livelihoods by reducing greenhouse gas emissions in advanced economies and by avoiding dangerous climate change. A legally binding agreement could also ensure that richer countries provide adequate financial and technical support to enable the poorest countries to adapt to climate change and to embrace low carbon development themselves. They should not be excluded from opportunities for low carbon development. So why do we need a legally binding agreement? Without a legally binding international agreement, there's no obligation to act. The alternative is high level political commitment. But this is very vulnerable to changes in governments and world events, as indeed has been demonstrated 
in the current economic crisis and indeed the political crisis in North Africa and the, um, uh, the Middle East. We have many examples of political declarations falling short of expectations. For example, the 2002 Monterey um, consensus on financing for development, under which developed countries pledged to deliver the 0.7% of GDP to overseas development assistance. We know that few countries have reached that goal despite repeated political statements of intent. And likewise, the 2015 deadline is looming on the Millennium Development Goals, and we know that the commitment under Goal 8 um, still has not been um, uh, implemented and nor um, our countries as on track as we would have hoped. Political commitments to reduce greenhouse gases cannot guarantee to keep warming below dangerous levels. If it were the case, if it were the case that all world leaders were convinced that climate change was a top priority, a top political commitment, then that might be enough. That might actually be enough to secure an urgency and a seriousness about being on track to staying below and significantly below 2 degrees Celsius and 450 parts per million. But with many competing national and international priorities, all too often climate change slips down the agenda. Certainly, if you look at the United States and other countries, it's not in the top 10 of the priority concerns um, of many people in the government or administration. It may be um, higher in President Obama himself, but not um, in real terms um, the kind of priority which it needs to be. So what is the essence of what we mean by legally binding? A legally binding agreement would include measures for holding the international community and individual states to account for their actions. Nothing short of a new international treaty or protocol can provide the level of commitment and certainty. As we know, decisions taken by the conference of the parties of the UNFCCC and the meeting of the parties of the Kyoto Protocol don't legally bind parties to act. They represent political commitments, but there's no process of accountability between the parties. To be effective, such legally binding international commitments need to be accompanied by a system of enforcement and compliance. The robustness and credibility of a post-Kyoto regime depends on clear rules and incentives for compliance which are more likely to be achieved through legally binding commitments. So what is the current situation? At present, we have a situation where the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol is set to expire on the 31st of December 2012. While imperfect, for example, the United States has not ratified and emissions reductions aren't ambitious enough under the KP, the protocol represents the only legally binding international commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As a result of COP16 in Mexico last December, we have the Cancun agreements, a set of COP decisions which provide a framework from which to develop a comprehensive international response to climate change. But they're not legally binding, and more work is needed to, to develop them into a new climate regime. So, as many of you will know, and as uh, so many moral voices try to urge upon us, time is ticking. Without Kyoto, we have no legal imperative to reduce emissions, just a pledge and review system which essentially allows countries to set their own levels of ambition. The pledges on the table don't correspond with the now shared objective of limiting warming to less than two degrees above pre-industrial levels. In fact, they have us on a trajectory towards dangerous climate change with warming in excess of three degrees and perhaps more. To date, there has been a two-track approach to securing a new agreement one track under the Kyoto Protocol and the other under the UNFCCC called Long-Term Cooperative Action, LCA. On the Kyoto Protocol, which I'll call the KP side from now on, efforts have focused on amending Annex B of the protocol, which contains emission limitation and reduction targets. The discussion on the numbers 
and level of ambition has been difficult and we're still far from agreement. In order to amend the protocol, changes would have to be made to the climate, in the climate conference in Durban this December to allow for the required six-month notification period before changes could be adopted at COP18 in December 20, uh, 2012. In addition, three quarters of the parties would need to complete their domestic ratification processes and deposit their acceptance of amendments by the 3rd of October 2012. As a result, a gap between the end of the first commitment period and the beginning of a new one is very likely. That's a very tight agenda, and there isn't a sense of the political will to meet that tight uh, timeline. In the short term, a gap would not affect the application of the Kyoto Protocol if parties remained committed to it. The conference of the parties to the convention and the meeting of the parties to the protocol could continue to carry out their functions and decide on subsequent commitments at a later point in time. But there would be no binding emission reduction targets. And the operation of some of the Kyoto Protocol's processes, for example, the maintenance of national inventories and reporting, and mechanisms, especially the CDM and emissions trading, would be uncertain. If parties don't reach an agreement on Kyoto in Durban, the only real hope for avoiding a gap between commitments periods is to make a provisional amendment to the Kyoto Protocol. And this is allowed for under the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. A new commitment period or an extension of the existing commitment period could be provisionally applied before the end of 2012. So there is a little bit more time if there's a political will to keep the Kyoto Protocol alive. There are, as you know, obvious limitations to the KP, notably that the largest emitters are not part of it, in particular the United States and China. And this is why a parallel negotiating track under the Convention has been trying to develop a new agreement that would include all parties to the Convention. This LCA track has made progress, but didn't deliver the much hoped for fair binding agreement um, in Copenhagen in, 19, in 2009. A new agreement or treaty would replace or complement the Kyoto Protocol and create a new climate regime. Proposals by parties for new legal instruments haven't gained enough momentum to be considered real contenders. However, the Cancun agreements do signal a desire to keep working under the LCA track, with a legally binding agreement still the proclaimed objective. The decision of, in the Cancun Agreement states, and I quote, nothing in this decision shall prejudice prospects for or the content of a legally binding outcome in the future. So that's still what the parties have set their sights on, even if we're not seeing enough commitment and uh, work on precisely what this agreement would entail. The legal form of a final deal that may establish a wider comprehensive framework to tackle climate change remains an open question. What I think is seriously lacking, and it's you, the younger generation in universities, and younger than you, who will suffer most if we don't have that sense of urgency, is a, a real understanding of what we're talking about and what it means for this century and this earth that we um, are the temporary inhabitants of. We need a compelling sense of urgency. Unfortunately, the horizons of political leaders tend to be short term, a matter of at most four or five years. From a climate justice perspective, the time horizons are longer, yet the need to act starts now. It's imperative that the world is made safer and fairer with a legally binding agreement in Durban, which guides us to 2050 and beyond. That's clearly what climate justice demands. However, in the absence of the necessary urgency and foresight, it becomes necessary to consider a wider range of options to strengthen a new climate regime. Work is ongoing on several fronts to assess the options open to the international community, including some work supported by the Government of Ireland and carried out by UNEP and the World Resource Centre, the World Resources Institute, which will be finalised by the Bonn session of the UNFCCC this June. What I would like to next 
examine is some of these options which are more pragmatic, if I put it that way. First of all, to continue to develop the COP decision based on the Cancun agreements. In Cancun, the convention or LCA track was extended for one year to present the results of its work to COP17 in Durban. Its mandate is to continue to work on developing measures related to adaptation, mitigation in developed and developing countries, technology transfer, and capacity building. Steps will be taken to set up the institutions established by the Cancun Agreement, including an adaptation committee, a transitional committee to design the Green Climate Fund, and a technology, a technology executive committee. At COP17, a series of further non-binding decisions can be expected that will gradually fill out the broader institutional and regulatory frameworks um, created by Cancun. And for some issues like adaptation, we don't necessarily need a fully binding agreement. So this process is not negative. It can continue, provided we can get a legally binding agreement for the parts such as the um, uh, commitment on cuts and emissions that we actually do need in order to be safe. The pledge and review system established in Copenhagen and adopted in Cancun could continue to develop and hopefully increase in ambition. But at present, the levels of ambition don't uh, are not adequate to prevent dangerous climate change and the review system isn't strong enough to hold countries and parties to account. So while it can be argued that on some issues such as adaptation and capacity building, COP decisions provide, inadequate, uh, provide adequate commitment and guidance to parties to act, other issues such as emission reductions and financial commitments require a legally binding agreement. <coughs> There is a suggestion that we might try to make the COP decisions legally binding. Um, that the COP could decide that its decisions are legally binding in order to add weight to agreements made by parties in this forum. However, my understanding is that strict legal interpretation would conclude that this step alone would merely confer stronger political commitment um, in these decision, to these decisions and wouldn't turn them into decisions that were legally binding. The second area is political agreement outside the UN FCCC process. While Copenhagen was a lesson in how not to do multilateralism because there was a lack of transparency, there was a high level of mistrust, only some countries were involved in the Copenhagen Accord. Um, nonetheless, the Copenhagen Accord does provide a, posit a possible model for progressing the negotiations a smaller group of countries could work on the key issues and seek a political agreement outside the formal process. The key elements of this agreement could then be brought into the UNFCCC process at a later date, as, in fact, was the case of the Cancun agreements, which drew heavily on the Copenhagen Accord. However, there are risks to this approach, which tends to focus on the agenda of large emitting countries rather than small, vulnerable countries. Any future use of this model would have to be carefully considered, would have to be transparent, would have to include small, low-emitting and vulnerable nations, and also would have to factor in the role of the UN system in international decision-making. A third area is overarching framework and schedules. It has been suggested as a way forward to have a new overarching framework agreement or treaty, setting out a common goal of limiting warming to below 2 degrees Celsius, while exploring the feasibility of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, and agreeing to review progress in 2015, along the lines of what was agreed in Cancun, um, but not making it legally binding. Um, uh, sorry, but making it legally binding, I'm sorry. This could be accompanied by a set of schedules. This was proposed by Aus Australia in the negotiations setting out each party's commitments to reduce emissions in line with key milestones, for example, 2015, 2020, 2030, 2050. In this form, the schedules would not be legally binding, but parties could decide to incorporate them into the framework treaty or a new protocol at a later date. For example, when they've established that the measures are feasible domestically. And this approach would appeal very much to the United States and to China, who are unwilling to commit internationally until they have domestic agreement. So you'd have 
a simpler framework that was legally binding committing to the target and then countries could bring in their commitments as they made them and as they worked them through that they were doable and feasible domestically. However, there are again risks here. At present, the pledges of the parties aren't ambitious enough to prevent dangerous climate change and there's no guarantee that the parties would step up their levels of ambition in time to avoid warming of more than two degrees um, Celsius. A fourth area is what are called incremental approaches. If a comprehensive legal deal is not on the cards right now, it's necessary to examine incremental approaches to securing agreement. Could we, for example, agree a roadmap in Durban which determines the type of legal agreement we're aiming for and which sets out milestones to reaching that objective? Again, there are risks that we may not make adequate progress in line with the commitments, but it would at least indicate a shared desire to have a legally binding agreement. Another incremental approach would be to set a goal for emissions targets and then start to work towards this sector by sector, starting with those that are easiest to identify, to measure and report and verify. As with the EU experience in setting up the emissions trading system, we, must, we could start with large single point sources of CO2, namely power plants and big industrial installations. Even on a global scale, these are identifiable, quantifiable, and lend themselves to monitoring and verification. They would also facilitate emissions trading at global scale and keep the carbon market alive now that it is finally starting to reap some dividends for Africa and least developed countries. In time, other sectors such as transport could be added, thereby increasing overall emissions reductions. Another area which is not strictly legal but is being talked about is a code of conduct for major polluters. The um, code of conduct would be to reduce their emissions and in contrast to a sector by sector approach under the convention, which would be top down and potentially legally binding, a code of conduct for polluters would bypass nation states and exist outside the convention. Under such a model, the major polluting industries would sign up to a voluntary code of conduct and participating companies would set their targets and hold each other accountable. With the GDP and emissions levels of some multinational corporations exceeding those of some developed countries, there is potential for significant emissions reductions taking that course. A good example of what can be achieved through this approach is the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, a non-governmental body that develops worldwide standards, including voluntary um, environmental management standards for corporations. So ISO um, 14000 certificate certification requires a corporation to commit to the top, commit at the top level of management to a range of environmentally beneficial actions, including the prevention of pollution. Corporations, of course, driven um, by market demand uh, to want that ISO certification. Key questions that arise if the approach is to be pursued include, one, how to ensure that a code of conduct complements action taken by nation states, and two, how to incorporate such a code of conduct in a legally binding agreement. I think we also have to look at the way in which we can think of the COP agreement as a living instrument. The mandate of the Conference of the Parties to amend the UNFCCC or the um, Kyoto Protocol or adopt a new legal agreement is broadly limited to the UNFCCC's objective and guiding principles. The objective of the Convention and any uh, re um, uh, related legal instruments is to achieve, and I quote, the stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations at a level that would prevent dangerous um, anthropogenic um, interference with the climate system, end quote. Core principles guide parties in achieving this objective, such as the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. This is usually interpreted in relation to the Convention's distinction between developed and developing countries, with developed countries' responsibility or historic, for historic greenhouse gas emissions resulting in a legal obligation to reduce emissions and possible support to developing countries and to provide support to developing countries. Most developing countries believe that this distinction between developed 
Annex 1 and developing non-Annex 1 countries should um, underpin a new agreement. However, I think we have to think about the reality of growth and development in our world today. The differentiation between countries on the basis of different situations and needs isn't a static one. The convention recognizes, and again I quote, that the share of global emissions originating in developing countries will grow to meet their social and development needs, end quote. It's a living instrument that will develop to reflect present and future conditions. It doesn't preclude alternative forms of differentiation, which could, for example, allow the Annex 1 list, list to be amended to include advanced developing countries and the OPEC nations. This would alter the dynamic in which the negotiations take place by allowing differentiation between the large heterogeneous group of countries currently classed as developing, from the very smallest to some very large emerging economies. This could reflect the development of, this could influence the development of a second commitment period of the Kyoto Pro Protocol, or indeed a new agreement. Let me now come to an area that some of you may have thought I would spend more time on, and I do want to connect it, and that is the international um, human rights system, the UN human rights system. It was significant that the Maldives, a country facing severe climate-related impacts, brought the issue of climate change to the UN Human Rights Council in 2008. And I recall that there was a lot of resistance from a lot of rich developed countries to this being brought into the Human Rights Council. But um, that resulted in the first ever resolution of the Council on this subject. A number of follow-up steps, including a subsequent report in, 19, in 2009 by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights on the relationship between climate change and human rights, and a further resolution by the Council in 2009, have continued to strengthen government attention to the link between the international human rights and climate change regimes. Discussions in Geneva during the ongoing session of the Human Rights Council are exploring a number of additional options that could be taken by the UN human rights system in the years ahead, including the possibility of a new UN human rights expert mandate or mechanism, as we sometimes call it, that could take forward some of the normative and legal issues still outstanding involving states' human rights obligations and how to increase legal accountability for human rights abuses brought about by environmental issues, including climate change. I should point out here um, as well that in 2008, the resolution of the Human Rights Council and the report of the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights were transmitted, in 2009, were transmitted to the UNFCCC for its consideration. And this led to preambular language being introduced in Copenhagen. I remember a number of us in Copenhagen were really trying to get this human rights language inserted. And now that has been uh, strengthened in a still, I think, preliminary way in the shared vision section of the Cancun Agreements, paragraph 8, which emphasizes that, and I quote, parties should, in all climate-related actions, fully respect human rights. So that's in the UNFCCC process. Parties should, in all climate change-related actions, fully respect human rights. Again, although it's not strictly uh, relevant to a legal agreement in a narrow sense, I think it might be interesting to look briefly at regional approaches. Regional approaches to reducing greenhouse gas emissions have been developed in North America in the absence of federal legislation and binding international commitments, due, of course, to the non-ratification by the U.S. of the Kyoto Protocol. 23 U.S. states and four Canadian provinces participate in three regional cap-and-trade schemes to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In the U.S., these schemes account for half the U.S. population and GDP and one-third of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. The Canadian provinces account for three-quarters of the population and GDP and almost half of national emissions. These schemes operate independently of the provisions of the Kyoto Protocol, which has both advantages, perhaps, and disadvantages. The key advantage is that even if there's a gap between commitments, um, between the commitment periods that I was talking about of the KP, these programs will continue to operate and reduce emissions. The key disadvantage is that they're not guided by ambitious international targets. 
and they're not reflected in federal legislation or even in the federal negotiating position um, at the international level. In contrast, the EU emissions trading scheme is an international scheme for the trading of greenhouse gas emissions allowances established by the community and its member states to fulfill their commitments to reduce anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions consistent with obligations under the Kyoto Protocol. The EU ETS covers some 11,000 power stations and industrial plants in 30 countries with the potential to link with comparable systems around the world in some form of global uh, carbon market. The absence of a second commitment period of the KP would arguably limit the future of the EU ETS to EU member states, where new targets could be agreed and enforced within the Union itself, but it would still be handicapped by um, no uh, renewal of the KP commitment. There are no regional cap and trade schemes operating currently in developing countries, and it's questionable whether these regions would have the capacity and resources to initiate such schemes without the support of the international community. This implies that an international agreement is needed if regional approaches are to have a significant impact on global emissions. The experience gained through the design and implementation of successful regional cap and trade uh, programs is highly valuable if shared with developing country regional groups. Another area that, again, isn't strictly legal, but I think it's becoming part of the narrative about climate change is more on the opportunity side, not just it's terrible, we're not on track to stay below 2 degrees Celsius, but are there opportunities? Is there another way of talking about climate? So while not a, a legal strategy as such, highlighting the positive of investing in a green economy can help to change the conversation around climate change and create real incentives for agreeing a new climate regime. The latest research carried out by the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, shows that investing just 2% of global, GD global GDP in 10 key sectors can kickstart a transition towards a low carbon, resource efficient economy. While 2 degrees of global um, GDP, 2% uh, of global GDP equates to 1.3 trillion US dollars, this is only a fraction of the total gross capital formation, which um, was 22% of global GDP in 2009. Greening the economy generates growth and produces higher growth in GDP and GDP per capita than a business as usual um, uh, uh, scenario within just five to 10 years, according to the UNEP report. Key investments in sectors such as agriculture, energy, tourism, forestry, fisheries, water and waste management can contribute to poverty alleviation and create much needed jobs. The research in this report also found that while global demand for energy will rise, it returns to current levels by 2050, which is about 40% less than what is expected under a business as usual scenario, thanks to advances in renewable energy. In addition, a green investment scenario is projected to reduce energy related CO2 emissions by about one third by 2050 compared to current levels. This would enable atmospheric concentrations of CO2 to be held below 450 parts per million by 2050, thus minimizing the risks of dangerous climate change. At the international and national level, policy reform in the area of subsidies, trade and investment will be needed to, to facilitate green growth. Steps are already being taken in this direction Investment in green technology is at an all-time high, with 40% of global investment coming from non-OECD countries, including India, Brazil, and China. The green economy approach is a positive way of addressing the twin challenges of growth and climate change, while decoupling growth from intensive energy and resource use. And I do believe that if the climate change negotiations could reflect this potential and opportunity, it would greatly facilitate the possibility of reaching an agreement on a climate uh, treaty or uh, uh, on a legally binding uh, treaty. So how do we maintain momentum? Finally, it's the important focus, I think, in the time ahead to build on the momentum around addressing climate change. And that momentum has been set in train in recent years and was helped 
by the agreements in um, Cancun. It will require us to present the challenge and opportunities associated with climate change more effectively. President Nasheed of the Maldives has stressed the importance of keeping the current process alive. I remember watching him in Copenhagen uh, going around uh, you know, in a, a sort of desperate energy to keep the process alive and to try to uh, make um, whatever, uh, not any compromises, but he was willing to be flexible in order to keep things moving, in order to keep a legally binding treaty on the cards, in order not to kill the process. And President Nasheed believes strongly in the opportunities an, an effective response to climate change can bring. As he put it in a statement in July of last year, and I want to quote him, I think we have a serious problem over the way we present climate change to the outside world. I believe we need to view climate change not just as a challenge, but also as an opportunity. Cutting carbon shouldn't be considered a burden that will destroy jobs and hamper economic growth. Instead, going green should be seen as the greatest economic opportunity since the Industrial Revolution. This is an opportunity to improve things, to grow our economies in more sustainable ways, and to create wealth and employment. A deal should be viewed not as an impediment to growth, but as a boost. A deal must not be seen as a drag on development, but as a way of doing things better. Luckily, Cancun demonstrates that the process is far from dead. It has generated a renewed sense of momentum, and although not as imminent as many of us would wish, a legally binding deal is once again a possibility. Like President Nasheed, I must say I am willing to go step by step and layer by layer if that is what is needed to secure a meaningful agreement. But we have to be cognizant of time. The impacts of climate change are already being felt. They are already causing huge suffering to those who have not been responsible. Growing seasons are changing, sea, levels, sea level is rising, and people in the poorest parts of the world are at risk. The fundamental question is, how can we marshal the arguments and political will needed to secure a legally binding agreement? What more could we, we be done today to make the case for why the approach is so vital to achieving a sustainable way forward? We need every good idea, every ally, every innovative approach that's available. My aim and that of the foundation that I've established is to contribute to the global effort needed to secure a safe future for the poor and vulnerable and to amplify their voices and concerns at the international level. 2011 is the year to come to grips with the legal form of a future agreement and to set down concrete measures to achieving it. Time is running out and there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of work that universities can be engaged in, that a Center for Human Rights here in LSE can contribute to, that the Matrix Chambers has already contributed to by hosting a small meeting for us this afternoon to think ahead about a climate agreement. It's not a sexy topic. I hope some of you are not disappointed that I got into small print this evening on what is needed, but we do desperately need to clarify and demystify what are the options going forward and then try to push for the best option because we're talking about the future of the world. If you have a trade negotiation and it fails, it may or may not be a bad thing or a good thing, but we cannot fail to get into a legally binding situation, especially on emissions and on um, being verifiable and uh, being able to enforce compliance. So um, this is, I think, the biggest human rights issue, or certainly one of the biggest human rights issues of the 21st century, and it's a great pleasure to have been able to speak about it tonight, and I now look forward to your questions and contribution. Thank you very much. Mary. Uh, at this point, we move to the questions and answers. And looking around, I do see the 
what are you called, stewards? Stewards? <laughs> With the microphones and the red shirts, upstairs and down. We have a packed audience, and there's, of course, a forest of hands. I have this lady in the center here, and then I have a gentleman right at the back whose hand remains up, and he's now waving. <laughs> and I think we need to have this lady here at the back. Those are our first three. Uh, has the microphone now reached the lady or the person who was right there? Yes, please. And your name, please. And if you have an organization or an association or an NGO, it'd be good to know. And I think observations, if they're brisk, uh, questions also brisk, please. We'll try and keep this moving. We have some time, but we don't want to whitter it away with three or four hugely long interventions. So set the tone. Away you go. Okay. Um, my name is Elizabeth Larson. I'm a master's student in the geography department at King's College London in the water science and governance program. So my focus is on water, but I'll try not to talk about it. Uh, so you mentioned the, that we're already feeling the effects of climate change, which I also see in my studies of the change of the hydrological cycle and how that affects water, food, and trade. Um, so I'd like to know what you think about how large a role should the effects of climate change take in a binding agreement? Is it too ambitious to include mitigation measures in the agreement? And how can human rights law contribute to the idea of the international community working together to mitigate already seen effects of climate change in places that may not be able to afford to mitigate them themselves? Great. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, the gentleman at the back. Thank you. Uh, Richard O'Rourke, uh, former graduate here. I um, was in Dublin last year when you were at the Ashoka event and uh, heard you <coughs> excuse me, speak. And uh, you mentioned, and it seemed at the time that you hadn't had a chance to give it much thought, but it was the idea of uh, energy justice. And I was wondering if you'd had a chance to give it any further thought since, particularly given how access to energy correlates so strongly with standards of living, and equally where there seems to be a growing awareness that the, uh, there are limits to energy and uh, high and volatile energy prices destabilize governments and are damaging for developed economies. Um, that the picture becomes more complex and, and therefore that has greater challenges, I think, for achieving global consensus on, on trying to tackle climate change. Thanks, Richard. And uh, the lady here at the back. Hi, my name is um, Sheila Steelman and I'm a freelance filmmaker and I was in Cancun in December. Um, you mentioned very briefly carbon markets and carbon markets are definitely being uh, presented as a viable solution or, or a definitely a viable mechanism for, for, yeah, I say solution. I just wanted to know how um, do you feel that carbon offsetting and carbon trading on the carbon markets are effective mechanisms for meeting the overall goal of climate change? Or do you feel that they are just convenient mechanisms that vindicate the main perpetrators and simply allow them to continue emitting? Great, thanks, and thanks to all three for succinctness and clarity. Mary, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, three really very good and um, uh, relevant questions to um, our discussion. First of all, to um, Elizabeth on the issue of water. I must say, as you were asking your question, I was very much remembering that journey to the Delta region in Bangladesh in a seaplane and looking at fields absolutely um, covered with uh, salinated water that had destroyed the rice, destroyed the crops, destroyed the freshwater fishing. And then um, with um, Brack and, and indeed I also saw a project of Irish concern, seeing what adaptation really means, that you have to learn to plant new strains of rice that can grow on partly salinated water, that you have to learn to um, grow maize maybe. Um, fattening crabs was a real possibility in that partly salinated water, but the Muslims don't eat crabs, so it was the Hindu families who were able to take that market. And um, they had, again, fish that um, uh, could, um, uh, uh, were, were able to survive in that, in that partly salinated water. And all of that was new livelihoods. And I actually met a group, group, of, of, a group of local farmers, and I was amazed at how willing they were to adapt until I kind of thought they have no choice. You know, they, they actually have to change, and it's hard, but um, at least they were being supported in, in having options. So we do need the regime to deal with mitigation so that we don't have um, these dangerous climate impacts. We're already seeing them, and if we don't have mitigation, it has to be in the legal 
uh, agreement. That's the point I was emphasizing. But we also need to support adaptation. Um, Cancun said there needs to be a better balance between adaptation and mitigation, the funding. That's not happening. The funding is going to mitigation, which is important, but there's very little new money funding going to adaptation, even though um, that is uh, really very necessary. Um, yes, I recall um, during that uh, speech in Dublin um, for the Ashoka uh, Fellows that I talked about um, the importance of uh, access to energy as a justice issue, and I, I, I more and more think that it's the missing Millennium Development Goal but we have to think about what kind of energy. And what I'm talking about is access to affordable, low-carbon um, energy, um, where uh, we decouple growth and energy. So you can have low-carbon growth um, and resource-smart growth. And what is happening at the moment is that most of the work on renewables and on um, uh, providing for access to um, renewable energy is happening in the developed world and in China and in India, but it's not happening where there's a desperate need for um, access to energy. If you just think of the figures in the 21st century, I think they, they're, they condemn us, if I could put it that way, that at least 1.4 billion people have no access to electricity in our world today, most of them living where the sun shines most where it's perfectly doable now that they would have access to off-grid and all kinds of, um, uh, uh, of batteries, small solar, hydro, etc., energy. And 2.7 billion cook on firewood or animal dung and ingest into their lungs. And those 2.7 are largely women, of course. We have all kinds of examples that social entrepreneurs have provided of clean cooking, etc., and yet we haven't provided the scale and the um, affordable um, access to that energy. And I think that's a huge um, human rights issue in itself. Um, I, I'm glad that um, the issue of the, uh, the carbon markets was raised. Um, I would say um, I can't answer that as an expert um, because despite my passion for climate justice, I'm still in a learning curve. And I know there are abuses and that there is a lot of um, uh, sort of offsetting while continuing bad ways. And that's not acceptable. But it's also the case that if you have a well-functioning carbon, mar carbon market, it can be very beneficial um, to, for example, countries um, in Africa or elsewhere that want to start benefiting from um, uh, the RED program of forest, proper forest maintenance and conservation. And um, that's just beginning to possibly happen. So um, I think it's something we need to watch very carefully, and I'm learning to uh, you know, be rigorous myself in knowing what is appropriate in establishing a carbon, a carbon market and what is abuse and simply offsetting and carrying on with bad habits. Thanks, Mary. Uh, I do apply an arbitrary group justice in my selection of speakers. <laughs> There's a gentleman with a shirt which is blue who's in a hitherto neglected space. There's a lady in the second row who caught my eye first, I'm afraid. And we've had, to, is there anybody over here who's feeling as though they want to be loquacious? <laughs> right, you've had your five seconds of potential fame. There's a gentleman in the third row up who is now looking around. Sir, yes, it's, it's, uh, you can kick us off actually. Uh, up one to that gentleman, and then the two I've just described to you. Thank you. My name's uh, Rafe Smith. I'm a lawyer and campaigner of the Campaign to Protect Rural England. My question is about the compatibility of tackling climate change with the idea of proportionality uh, in two contexts. One is about trade disputes, where if a country tries to take action against climate change, another one says, well, that's not the least intrusive way you can do it, and that's discriminating against our goods. The other example is where uh, you might have some, something that interferes with human rights, and someone challenges a measure to tackle climate change, saying there's better ways that don't infringe on human rights. How compatible is effective action against climate change with the notion of proportionality? Thanks, Ray. And uh, lady here, just uh, giving your name in the usual way. Hi, I'm Geetha Parry. I'm Head of Legal at Friends of the Earth. Um, I've got uh, three questions, which I'll be brief with. Three short ones. Three short ones. Um, I have the benefit of working with lots of campaigners and therefore knowing in fact what the limitations are of law at any level. So they're basically politically focused questions. 
First relates to the Kyoto Protocol. Um, a lot of the um, things you talked about with MRV and compliance already exist for developed countries in the Kyoto Protocol. And looking at the LCA text, there's very little similar provision. So essentially what you might look at if you do have a new legally binding agreement is developed countries moving to a much weaker system. Um, so that, there's a question on that um, and, and what the consequences of that would be and whether it would in fact be better to say in fact that those countries should stay within the KP. Um, in terms of developing countries, um, you, do, you have a, a system that's starting to be created in the LCA track um, and they are taking actions. Um, and for example, China has introduced, I think, a 17% um, carbon intensity reduction target for the next five years, which in fact is a lot of people are saying, well, comparing that to Europe um, or even or other countries, that's, quite a, that's a really big move. So how would putting a country like China, which is a recent emitter, into the same group as a country like the US, which has historical responsibility, um, reflect the, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities? Because there has to be an acknowledgement that that is, in fact, a, I would say, a, a breach of that principle if they were in the same system. Um, and then finally, a question about climate and human rights. Which will now be paused very succinctly. Yes. <laughs> Um, what scope do you see for a mechanism among those being set up for looking at um, streamlining human rights policies within the um, international climate framework? Thank you very much, Keith. And the gentleman has got the microphone. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Alex Meredith, I'm a, a lawyer working in the carbon markets. And the question relates to climate justice. And the follow-on I wanted to ask about comes back to the point that's just been made over here, which is about the administration of climate justice and the access to climate justice. Do you see it as being feasible in any way to set up some kind of international environmental court that could administer climate justice a little bit more directly rather than through the human rights framework? And is that something that your foundation is interested in pursuing or supporting to, to move more broadly beyond just climate justice but environmental justice in, in the context of oil, um, gas, other, other, other areas where people's rights are infringed by, by harm to the environment all over the world? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, I think we'll take those three. Yep. Okay. Again, um, really very <laughs> interesting questions. Um, the gentleman from um, uh, describes uh, working on, on issues of rural England, um, uh, the, the, the issue of proportionality. Um, I'm not sure that I fully understood the, the use of the proportionality um, in that um, context. Um, um, certainly, um, uh, uh, we may well see interesting trade disputes in the future um, if there is an attempt to have heavy carbon goods going into um, areas where um, these are not any longer acceptable because they, um, uh, the carbon footprint is too heavy. Um, but um, uh, that's a use of the trade mechanism um, which we may see um, in the future. I think I didn't um, understand well enough your, your, your question. Would you Ray, to, Ray do you want to have a quick yeah. go? Where are you going? There you are. Yeah. yeah. This now might again, become. because I think I, I just I'll, lost the. This now this might provoke a logistical crisis, but let's test the metal of the stewards. Uh, <laughs> Ray w wants the microphone back yeah. in order yeah. to produce a very well. To make, me, to make me understand better his question. Uh, <laughs> There's an example of a, a car advert in America with the green police. I don't know if you've seen it on YouTube, but I don't want to name check the manufacturer. The idea is that if we have things like tradable carbon quotas, yeah. that would mean such an intrusion on personal liberty. It would be difficult to justify uh, those sorts of intrusions that we need to get possibly to uh, kind of have radical reductions in carbon emissions. And the problem is that people might say, well, you know, you can't justify that level of intrusion because hmm. it should be another country that takes that amount of emission yeah. reduction or in fact climate change isn't that serious, therefore we don't need that degree of intrusion on people's human rights. Yeah. Right, great, thanks. Okay, Ray. now I think I, I understand and I can, I can understand the, um, the, the kind of balancing you're, you're talking about. It, it, I, I suppose it comes down to um, a, a balancing to a certain extent and certainly um, uh, it doesn't seem to warrant an over-intrusion um, of the kind that, um, that, 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 that you've been describing. But uh, I suppose I'm so focused on the urgency of getting uh, a tougher um, emissions reduction system going that um, I'm not sure I support green police, but <laughs> I like a lot of measures that will, that will, that will put us in that direction. Um, the Friends of the Earth, um, very um, good 
uh, questions. Um, I, I accept that you know, the uh, Kyoto Protocol system at the moment is uh, more rigorous than they're talking about in the LCA track, but the LCA track at the same time could mean a wider agreement, and if we could really be serious about the target that has been agreed of two degrees um, uh, Celsius, and um, it doesn't exclude going down to 1.5, um, and then made the process of getting there under the LCA more rigorous, which is not happening, I agree, at the moment, then that would be um, an acceptable alternative. Um, I, I think you know, what, 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 what concerns me is the very tough timelines for um, a new, um, you know, a, a, a formal um, KP, new commitment period, and we can have for a while um, a carryover um, if, if that's politically accepted. But, um, you know, I, 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 um, I, I don't mind under which track as long as it's an effective political, uh, um, legal agreement at the end of the day, and I think it's possible to strengthen the LCA approach, um, and, and that's the one that's more comprehensive at the end of the day. Um, but it's a real point, and I, you know, I, I think it's uh, Friends of the Earth are um, you know, right to be campaigning on that. Um, um, the um, point about the developing countries and the common but differentiated responsibilities that China is already, as you rightly said, committing um, to um, serious reduction in the five-year plan, a 17% um, reduction, I'm not saying that you equate totally. Um, I'm saying that we're locked into Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 boxes at the moment, whereas the reality is that the factual situation is changing. And we could get rid of the annexes altogether and, and try to have um, as binding commitments as we can and as good a, a, an MRV as we can um, for both. Um, but I, I, I fully accept, and it's part of the climate justice, that um, um, the, the common but differentiated responsibilities means we, we must continue to take account of the historic responsibility. Um, I'm not trying to in any way dilute that. And um, I, I really think that there's quite interesting work being done under the international human rights system now. There's hopefully going to be an expert meeting in January uh, organized by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNEP, and the UNFCCC to discuss a new legal mechanism, which I think would be really very interesting it could be an independent expert, it could be a special rapporteur, it could be uh, to try to begin to work out a normative framework for um, violations of, of human rights. And again, I think it's interesting that the shared vision now includes um, respect for, for human rights. And um, the, I, I've heard uh, reference, particularly here in London, um, to the possibility of developing an international environment court, and I don't know again, exactly how this would be envisaged. Um, I am associated with an eminent group. Um, for some reason, I've got so old and being an elder, you know, I get involved in these eminent groups, but I am involved in an eminent human rights group um, that was established during the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And some of the members of the group have focused particularly on a world court for human rights, which would be able to cover some of these issues because it would bring transnational corporations under its jurisdiction, and that would bring in some of the environmental issues. But I also have heard um, uh, of um, an interest in the need to establish an international environment court. I think, you know, I'd, I'd like to see how that would proceed rather than um, have a fixed view beforehand about it. Thank you very much, Mary. This gentleman has volunteered to represent the hitherto silent part of the group. Uh, the lady in the front has been keen to get me. And I think we'll take, let's try and fit four in, because this gentleman at the back and this lady here, if we, we need to be pretty quick and pretty disciplined if we're going to do this and get some more in afterwards. So I'll ask you to remember to give your name and be pretty succinct. Sir, start us off. I'll try to be, and I needed to, yes, fill the gap. I wanted to um, raise the business of um, government momentum. And you please. are? Uh, and my name is John Harris. Um, I'm a lawyer, and I chair the UK Coal Forum, which is a government-convened industrial stakeholder body. Um, interestingly, we have pressed both the previous government and the present government to make much greater um, and urgent progress for carbon capture and storage for both coal and gas power stations. And I particularly make that point because so much of this is about practical um, measures 
there are example rumors that the new office for carbon capture and storage in the UK is going to be announcing its budget to be cut um, as part of the government's austerity um, program um, at the end of this month. Um, if we're to make um, progress, we need these um, practical um, measures, um, including market trading. And um, I just wondered um, how um, um, Mary Robinson sees the position of momentum at the moment. Thank you. U.S. Um, congressional um, um, elections don't augur well for the um, um, Obama um, program. How do we get the momentum back on track? And Thank your you. leadership is so welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you for it. I'm glad to get that American dimension. No, they, that was excellent. This lady at the front uh, with... Um, I'm Alma Marston. I work for the Bretton Woods Project here in London, and I'm a former student of Mary, so good to see you, Mary. Hi, <laughs> um, a question about the role of business. Um, you will have probably seen that Chevron was just slapped with an $8 billion fine for polluting communities in Ecuador. Also, right now, there's all sorts of movement with John Ruggie's framework on business and human rights. And I'm wondering if you are, are making any links in the movements around the business and human rights discussion and what's possible as it relates to climate change. Thank you very much. And we'll take the gentleman at the back very briefly, and then the lady here, and then we, we use, we'll use the last bit if we have time with upstairs. So, uh, Nick. was it you, Nick? Good. Excellent. Say who you are. Nick Walker. Um, I think I count as alumni from the Center for the Study of Human Rights as I hold the certificate in the study of international human rights. I'm very interested to know how the access to resources issues is best understood in terms of the human rights debate. I was approached recently by a third, uh, third world, sorry, developing world, um, water charity, saying that access to water is a human right. And I thought it might be better expressed as a human need. I just wondered to what extent the human right debate human rights debates can, and can further help us in understanding access to resources. Great. Thanks, Nick. And last person in this round was this lady here, who's reminded me of that, and we have two or three upstairs directly after we've got Mary's responses, which might be all we have time for. But this is... Um, thank you. My name is Melanie Strickland. I'm involved in a movement called Wild Law UK, which is based on the ideas um, in the book um, Wild Law Manifesto for Earth Justice, written by a, a South African lawyer. Um, last year, there was um, the World People's Conference on the rights, um, sorry, the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. Um, it was attended by over 35,000 people, and the outcome of that um, meeting was um, a proposed universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth. Um, that declaration recognises the inherent value of nature and recognises the rights of nature to exist and um, the rights of natural communities to their habitats. Um, it completely rejects the carbon market and the commodification of nature. Um, and since there's been um, a global alliance established to get legal rights for nature. So my question is, um, do we not need to be more ambitious and get recognize the, the rights of nature to exist and what does the UN think about the proposal because I know it's gone before them thank if you, you know thank you and if we were, I mean I don't want to put pressure to be short but we yeah. we can get a few okay. more in before the end okay I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I must say I'm really pleased and impressed with the questions and, and um, the perspectives that are obviously um, here which, which is great um, on the carbon capture and storage um, uh, you know uh, Obviously, it would be important if there can be serious breakthroughs in carbon capture and storage, as long as we also um, keep the pressure on the reduction of use of coal, um, and, you know, try to um, uh, deal with um, uh, what we have, but, but be phasing out um, that as, a, as, as an option. It, it, it does worry me that from time to time the World Bank or others you know, will, will, will support um, new coal um, projects, um, uh, and, and I think we need to... Um, be very, be very clear on that. And um, uh, um, Emma, your um, reference to um, the role of um, business, and in particular the framework of Professor John Ruggie, the Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework, we discussed uh, recently in Geneva in the human rights context um, that it does lend itself um, to 
uh, a responsibility of corporations uh, to respect to all human rights, and therefore, um, in the context of um, their responsibilities um, to not just have um, environmental impact assessments within the company, but also human rights impact assessments. And I think we, by linking those two, we can probably reinforce that process. Equally, there's a, there's a duty on states to protect from um, violations of human rights by non-state actors, in this case, corporations. And I think we're at the beginning of a very interesting um, uh, link um, across to um, the uh, violation of um, uh, the, the, the impacts of, of climate change. There are problems of causation, which we also discussed, but I think, again, um, there, there are issues that can be dealt with. Um, uh, the question at the back, um, if I could just take the last part, about access to water as a human right. In fact, the General Assembly of the United Nations has recognized access to water and sanitation as a human right explicitly quite recently, and there's quite a lot of work on it. In fact, I chair the board of something called the Institute for Human Rights and Business here in London, and we've done a paper on water and, and right to water, and it's influencing the CEO water mandate at the moment. So you might just like to um, look at the website, www.ihrb.org, if that's, if that's of, of interest to you. And on the um, Rights of Mother Earth, the Bolivian uh, conference, uh, I have some um, real sympathy with the approach, but not with what is actually being called for legally. Um, I think we need to uh, root our sense of sustainable de development in a very close link with the sustainable earth and sustainable uh, creatures and, um, and, and all uh, living things. But I don't think myself, and I know um, uh, this will not please the questioner, but I don't think myself that it helps um, to try to give separate legal rights. I think we need um, more emphasis on the custodial and the... Um, uh, the um, way in which um, we need to uh, ensure that when we talk about human rights, we are talking intergenerationally if we talk about climate change and that we um, see the responsibility. Um, I have before now quoted Barbara Ward um, when I gave a Barbara, Barbara Ward lecture, and she urged us to um, be uh, guests in, on this earth and tread lightly as other creatures do. And I think that's a nice way of, of, of putting um, that point. Thank you. Uh, some more questions? Uh, we've got a couple more. We've got the gentleman in the check shirt uh, who caught my eye astutely early. And we had this gentleman here. And we'll take you two. Uh, and I think we'll take this lady right here. But you're going to have to be fantastically short because I, people are getting anxious about this drink, wondering where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Thank you. Um, my name is Christina. Uh, and Christina, where are you? I'm here. <laughs> Uh, you're going to take it first. Fine, Christina, that's fine. <laughs> Sir, you have to hang back a little bit because Christina has the floor, but by permission, it's just the wrong order. Yes, Christina, short. Okay, thank you. I, um, I work with women and children in domestic violence in London, and I was wondering about the, um, what are the gender implications of climate change? Because I believe that I read somewhere that is impacting women differently than on men, and this is due probably because of division of gender work and... Uh, access to resources, if, which is your opinion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Christina. And, sir? Uh, David Evans, philosophy student. Given people's strong emotional attachment to high carbon lifestyles, it seems to be a necessary part of a green economy that there should be a redrawn line between public and private life. The wealth gap is not only between nations, but also between individuals. Rich people in powerful positions are the worst culprits. So, consequently, there seems to be a, a very strong case that there should be a green police force Thank you. I like the way that ended, too. That's great. Right. Right. More of the Green Police. Excellent. And the very last question uh, is this gentleman, two up and centre with the microphone, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Mary, for your presentation. I'm Philip Pearson from the TUC Trade Union Congress. And uh, I've been to a number of the UN conferences on climate change with the ITUC delegation, an observer body to the UN. My first question really is how fragile in the UN preamble text you referred to is that language on human rights? Because it certainly wasn't there on day one in Cancun. Uh, 
Um, secondly, my, uh, my second question is around this notion of... Second of two, I of think. Of two, yeah. <laughs> well, sorry. It's just simply this notion of just transition and decent work, which also appears in the preamble. Mm. Within just transition, these ideas of consultation between stakeholders at national level and the notions of um, respect for labour and human rights. How, how much value would you also attach to the notions of just transition in the wider UN preamble? Thank you. Great, thank you, Philip. Okay. Uh, Mary. Okay, again, really very good and, and interesting questions. Christina, thank you. Uh, gender was raised. <laughs> uh, it would be terrible if we went away from a meeting on climate change and didn't bring out the very real and very tangible gender distinctions which you talked about. Um, climate change does impact differently on men and women. Um, it impacts very substantially on subsistence farmers and about you know, something like up to 70% of subsistence farmers in Africa are women. And if they have more problem with their farming, it means the, the household duties are even more severe. If it's water shortage, you have to go further for the water, more possibilities of getting raped, all of these issues. It has a huge impact. In fact, the first outing of the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice was to um, uh, raise women's leadership on climate justice in Cancun. We um, had a uh, uh, support from the Rockefeller Foundation to bring uh, women leaders together in New York first um, around the time of the General Assembly on the Millennium Goals and then uh, we had two meetings in Cancun, one on the, uh, I think it was the 4th of December, it was grassroots, indigenous, NGOs who were working on engendering the process, a large gathering, a lively discussion. And then the second one was with women who are in powerful positions in the UNFCCC process. And um, so we had Patricia Espinoza, the foreign minister of Spain, up Mexico, who was chair of the whole meeting, chair of the COP. We had Cristiana Figueres, who was the executive secretary of the UNFCCC process. We had Connie Hedegaard, um, Commissioner for Climate Action, and the ministers of Denmark and Ecuador, who were both also women. The one we didn't have, unfortunately, was the woman, two women ministers from South Africa who were also in Cancun. But we can't say that women aren't there. But what each of those women said at the time, sorry to be a bit long, but they, uh, what, each of those, <laughs> what each of those women said at that meeting was, it was a meeting on climate change, um, uh, climate justice, um, uh, women leaders on um, uh, climate change and climate justice. And they said, this is the first meeting we've attended in Cancun where this issue has been raised of gender. And that, I think, is part of the problem. Um, it, is, it, it has huge differential impacts on men and women, women and men. And, and we need to have more uh, attention paid to that. And there are some very good groups um, working on it. Um, the answer to David Evans... Um, Another way of, attack, of, of addressing that um, sharp difference between carbon footprints is some thinking on how to allocate more fairly um, this limited resource that we have of carbon in the atmosphere. And there are some quite interesting projects of, um, of um, increasingly looking to the carbon footprint of every individual. And then you get fined or you pay more or you, um, uh, you, you account for the fact that you are in excess of um, the allocation, um, and that is another way of uh, reaching more equity and justice. Um, it could be that it will be... Um, it, 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 we, we all have to change our lifestyles, and, and um, uh, you know, that starts um, in the home, it starts in the school, it starts in the local community. It starts, I'm glad to say, increasingly with the young people and with green schools and with um, uh, the, the way in which um, I think there is a, a greater sense of the need for a very dramatic change of lifestyles. Um, so, um, as I said, I'm also um, somewhat sympathetic to the Green Police myself, but um, um, within a human rights context. <laughs> and um, and um, uh, I, I'm glad that um, uh, there has been a good um, voice um, uh, uh, from the TUC uh, Congress. Um, I think it's a good question how fragile is the language on human rights that got into the Cancun agreements. It's a little bit stronger that got into Copenhagen because it's in the vision statement, not just in a perambular, but it's as fragile as the fact that we'd have to keep making sure not only that it remains there in the future um, COP17 and beyond, but also that it's strengthened and given more substance and content. And I would say the same about just transition and decent work. Um, I think the arguments in relation to decent work, and I did a lot of um, work with the ILO on decent work and the trade, global trade union movement, my friend Sharon Burroughs and others, um, on 
um, you know, livelihoods, the right to work in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the implications of that. The, you know, the reality is um, part of the movement that galvanized people in um, North Africa and in the MENA region, North Africa and um, uh, countries, um, countries like Bahrain, uh, Yemen, etc., is um, the despair of joblessness, the despair of lack of livelihoods, lack of employment. And I hope that's going to uh, impact on thinking, including in a ch climate change context. And that's why it's helpful that the language is in there, because now we have recent evidence that uh, it's uh, intolerable to people and has them risking tanks and tear gas and fighter jets to fight for the dignity of livelihoods, the dignity of democratic participation and decisions affecting them, etc. I mean, it's inspiring what has been going on, but it's high risk for those involved, and many of them are, are killed or uh, suffer a terrible injury and suffer um, uh, terrible fear um, for themselves and their, and their families. But it's all about um, the, the link between dignity and livelihoods and the, the the fact that it was right in the Universal Declaration to include the right to work, the right to form unions, which is under huge challenge at the moment in the United States. I mean, it's amazing in the 21st century that we could be, in some ways, um, going backwards. But even the range of questions that I've heard, and I must say it's probably about as good a range of audience questions as I've had experience of in promoting climate justice, um, uh, the range of issues shows that this is a huge human rights issue, a hugely important framing for justice in our world and we, we, we could we could we could have a you know a hundred more questions and still have things to talk about under the um, the idea of climate justice so I hope here in LSE that um, you continue to promote as my board member comma the whole concept and the idea and the fight that we have to fight okay thank you very much for that. There were, uh, five. Every, uh, every now and again running these uh, meetings, there's a spontaneous round of applause, which is unexpected and possibly even undesirable. I was trying to get over here to stop you applauding <laughs> so that you could prepare yourself for a proper round of applause, but you've now committed yourself to two sets of applauses. Let me say uh, that there were times when I thought that was rather like a, a tough PhD viva with uh, 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 Mary Robinson being subjected to an examiner's, uh, an array of examiner's questions, and I think we'll... Uh, I suppose I shouldn't be mentioning PhDs in LSE at the moment, but we would, uh, we, we would, definitely, we would definitely award the degree and, and we don't want, well, look, I'll leave it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, want to, I want to thank uh, the Centre for the Study of Human Rights uh, and, and in particular uh, Chaitin who's here for supporting this event with such enthusiasm uh, and to... Uh, I ask you to have a think about coming along because Chaitin himself is doing, I think it is an inaugural lecture, is that right, Chaitin? It's an inaugural lecture, which is a big deal in the university world. And it's got the fascinating title of The Virtues of Violence and the, Art and the Arts of Terror. The Virtues of Violence and the Arts of Terror. Uh, so there'll be a bit more about the environmental police there, I should think. <laughs> and uh, that's on the 23rd of March, 2011. And uh, we're very proud of a university environment which can have such scholarly engagements and combine them so effectively with a public outreach program like this. So many thanks to the Centre for the support, and also uh, Matrix Chambers, uh, which has uh, been terrific uh, in, in co-hosting this. And we're delighted that I, I mean, that's, I am a member of Matrix Chambers, that a, a barrister's uh, chambers can have, if I may say, the imagination to engage in a cutting edge event like this uh, in a university and not hunker down on one of these dead judge titled rooms in one of these obscure inns and have some retired judge lecture them ad nauseam. So well done, Matrix, if I may say so. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also, uh, and this is the penultimate thing, well done yourselves. I mean, it, it's incredible, really. I said this the other week at another event, but you seem to detect the tone of the speech as a collectivity and decide to divvy among yourselves responsibility for various aspects of it. And I call you wholly arbitrarily and it's incredible how you produce such an extraordinary spread of questions. Really amazing. Uh, I was relieved to have the uh, question about uh, women, or I would have been really reprimanded by my speaker later on, so that was good. Uh, and we had, I think, a record. I don't think I've ever had 13 people 
uh, asked questions in a session before. Uh, and if you count the nine or ten you asked and the fifteen you asked, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely a record. Now, uh, you're not to go until I say thanks to Mayor Robinson when you should applaud at the proper time, but I want to tell you that there are drinks in that are unveiled the atrium, which is a very posh bit of LSE, and you don't have to go up five flights of stairs. If, if, you, if you're going up five flights of stairs, you're going the wrong direction. Follow the more alcoholically inclined members of the LSE, and you'll find the atrium sort of out there. There's an immense amount of cardboard, and I have goodness knows where it is, but it used to be sort of out there. And uh, join us all for a drink. We'll be, everybody will be there. You're all invited. You're all invited. Uh, but the uh, last thing I want you to do is to once again thank Mary for a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much, Mary Robinson. <laughs>